So we've been walking through the Gospel of Matthew, chapters uh, 5 through 7, and we are in the middle of chapter 6. Uh, that's the Sermon on the Mount in those chapters. And we've been discovering a couple of themes just kind of creeping in and developing as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. And, and the first of those is, is that Jesus calls us as we follow him to be people who just live by a different standard and by different rules than people live by all around us. We are to be different. Um, we're not going to be like everyone else around us. Um, and that is because you and I are citizens of heaven. <laughs> we don't belong here. We just here and we're just here temporarily and we have to live um, according to the rules of the kingdom to which we are going um, in heaven. But secondly, the th second theme that is developing as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount is that you and I are to find and to be the person that God wired and created us to be in our religious expression. In Jesus' day, everyone got measured according to how well they lined up with the Pharisees. <laughs> and so instead of comparing themselves and how well they were doing in comparison to how God had wired them to be, everyone was concerned about, well, how well do I stack up against the Pharisees and what they're doing? God made each and every one of us, and he made us all a little bit different. And God has given you a particular personality and particular gifts and particular talents and abilities. And he wants you to find who that is that he created you to be. And then to express yourself in terms of your religious um, activities and your religious life in terms of who he called you to be. And how he made you uh, so that you begin to live, not to compare yourself with anyone else, but you live for the applause of God in the way that he wired you and made you. So let's, let's just open with prayer before we go to our first text. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, today for uh, the privilege of being able to look at your word and let it teach and guide us and direct us. Father, where I don't communicate clearly, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would come and be my interpreter. That your spirit would come and make clear what everyone needs to hear. That applies to them. And I pray, Lord, that you would just come and speak to us today by your word and by your spirit. And that you would open up our ears and our hearts to hear what you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we're going through, Jesus has just, uh, last week we looked at the Lord's Prayer. And um, right on the heels of that, this is the next text. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that you will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Well, now there's a little bit of a biblical history in regard to fasting. In the books of Moses, Moses had law, and there was only one day a year where the Israelites were commanded to fast, and that was on the Day of Atonement. You go a little further on in the Old Testament where you run into the major and the minor prophets, and the Israelite people are being hauled into captivity because of their sin, and so they go into the land of the uh, Babylonians, and while they're over there, they develop the practice uh, having some national fa fast days uh, to remember who they were and remember their homeland and all of that. There were also some 
days of fasting that personal or groups of people in the Old Testament would have, if there was a certain need for humility or confession or any of those kind of things, um, you would find that people, because of their circumstances, would decide to fast. Then there were also times when just things had gotten really, really severely bad, and there was a lot of desperation, or maybe they were in great danger or um, anguish, and then they would be called for a fast. One of those examples is the, is the book of Esther, where um, the king had been tricked into signing a, a pledge that all Jews in his kingdom would be killed. And, and so, what did the Jews do? They fasted uh, because of that desperation and all of that, and they saw God's hand deliver them. Fasting in the New Testament becomes more of an act of Christian self-discipline, and we, we uh, might do it in order to get in control of, of fleshly appetites that have kind of gotten out of control in our life or for other reasons. But wherever you look in the Scripture, one thing is always true. God opposes fasting when it's done merely as a form and it's largely hypocritical and when especially it becomes a substitute for obedience. <laughs> so, so if I'm fasting, but I'm not doing what I know God wants me to do, God's not impressed with my fasting at all. It doesn't do any good in his books. There's no reward for that. And, and we'll look at a couple of those texts. Um, and then we come to the Pharisees because this is who he's really addressing here. And he says, when you fast, do not fast like the Pharisees fast. Well, how did the Pharisees fast? Because we don't have any Pharisees running around Redfield. Um, so we want to know, how did they fast? Well, they actually fasted two days a week. It was Mondays and Thursdays that they fasted, and their fast became a big religious show <laughs> that included uh, just having a very sad face all day long. <laughs> no smiles on their faces. Um, they were somber. They would disfigure themselves. They would use makeup to look really sad and, and miserable and all that kind of stuff. They would not bathe. They would do anything. If it was a normal practice, they wouldn't do it on those days. They would try to make themselves look like they were just really suffering, um, practicing their Jewish faith and practicing this fast. And so one translation actually puts it this way. When you fast, do not be like the performers. <laughs> who are just doing it for a show. The purpose of fasting is to humble ourselves before God and to get control over our fleshly appetites and, and perhaps to ask for God's help in some area that is bothering us. But the Pharisees didn't use it for that purpose at all. The Pharisees used it, used their fasting simply to draw attention to themselves and Jesus was saying, there's no reward in that whatsoever. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus does not ban fasting. I, I, in one of my churches one time, I had a guy that was just adamant that fasting was not of God and no one should do it. And this and that. But notice what Jesus actually says here. When you fast, he doesn't say not to, but he says, when you fast, don't fast like the Pharisees. <laughs> Do it the way God designed you. <laughs> Do it to impress and honor him. So Jesus, you know, Jesus' disciples themselves, the Pharisees would question, why don't your disciples fast? The disciples of John the Baptist are fasting. Why don't your disciples? And Jesus said, when the bridegroom is here, when there's a wedding going on, we don't fast. <laughs> But when I ascend into heaven, then my disciples will fast. Well, there's a time and there's a place and there's a method to all of our spiritual disciplines, whether it's prayer or fasting or something else. And I don't have time to get into all that. But if you're ever interested, Richard J. Foster is a, just an excellent author in regard to all of those spiritual disciplines. But the point that Jesus really wants to make here for us today 
is that with fasting as with other spiritual disciplines, we shouldn't do them to impress anyone else. We, do, we practice our spiritual disciplines um, just to draw closer to God. And that should be the heartbeat of why we do everything we do. If we're, if we're doing anything, going to church or doing anything else to impress other people, we're not really helping ourselves or anyone else. Everything we do ought to do to develop and grow that relationship with God. Spiritual disciplines need to be done in order just to receive a reward from God the Father. The next text that comes along, man, I'm having trouble with this thing today. It says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In our next test, Jesus tells us and tells us that as followers of him, we're going to look at money and we're going to look at possessions different from people here in the world who do not know God. The Greek word is even worded stronger. It says, stop storing up treasures for yourself. <laughs> now, if you're honest and balanced in the way that you look at all of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, you know that Jesus is, is um, not against taking care of our families, that he's not against planning and preparing for retirement, that he's not against being as self-sufficient as we can be. You can find all kinds of texts and, and scriptures in support of that. So Jesus isn't undoing any of that, but Jesus wants us as his followers to know that those things are not our life mission. They can't become the thing that is the reason we live. And so Jesus wants us um, to take everything that he gives us and use it for his glory and for his honor. Um, and sometimes that means taking care of our families. Sometimes that means meeting needs around us and all of that kind of thing. To Christians, wealth and possessions are neither good nor evil. If you go to other world religions, you will be told that wealth and possessions, a lot of them will tell you that they're evil in themselves. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said the love of money is evil. <laughs> Money's not evil. It's just depending on how you use it and what you use it for. Um, the love of wealth is, is a great evil. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Hoarding, James says, is short-sighted. And so scripture calls us to a balance of being prepared for winter without becoming just hoarders and greedy materialists, that that's the reason we live for. Now, treasures on earth, Jesus says, can be attacked. They can deteriorate. They can rust. They can be stolen. They can uh, be wiped out by inflation um, due to mold and mildew and one parsonage that we lived in. Um, we burned a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> I mean, we, we lost basically everything on the bottom uh, deck of that house. Um, we filled dumpsters. I took truckloads, pickup loads of stuff to the landfill. Um, and I'm not real sentimental, so um, it didn't bother me a whole lot, but I am a little bit of a neat freak. And so handling all those nasty boxes of crystallized possessions <laughs> bothered me more than getting rid of some of that stuff. But I still can tell you some of the stuff that was sentimental to me that I hauled away to the landfill. <laughs> you know, it was just gone. Mold and mildew had just destroyed all of that stuff. Well, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor that um, stood up to the Nazi regime. And because of that, he was imprisoned, and actually the Nazis killed him. Uh, but before he um, was killed, he, he wrote uh, several books in prison. One of them was Only One Master. 
And in that book, he says when Jesus calls us or when he talks to us, it oftentimes does not get access to our hearts because our hearts are dark because of all the things that are, we are clinging to. <laughs> our hearts are closed to him because they've already been given to something else. And then he says, earthly goods are to be given to us to be used, not to be collected. Where our treasure is, that is where our trust is. That's where our security and our consolation is. And he says, be careful because hoarding can become idolatry. Well, there's a man who basically had lost everything when he was put in prison. <laughs> everything his whole life that he had saved and all of that, it was just gone. Many of us in the last year have seen savings and retire accounts uh, just crumble. Um, in addition to dealing with rising inflation and so shortages of things on the shelves that we were just, we always knew they were going to be there. Um, and if nothing else, this last year has t given us a good opportunity to ask what it is that our hearts really belong to. <laughs> what, are, what is it that we really treasure? And what is it that we really trust in and all of that? If our love is our love for and trust for God, the primary thing in our life, or have we found our lives are really wrapped up in just loving and trusting our bank accounts, our retirement accounts, our possessions, and all of those things? And if nothing else, that's a question that we ought to be asking <laughs> as, as a lot of things are changing in our culture. John Wesley once visited a, a very wealthy owner of a vast plantation and he was riding horses, and he rode horses around that plantation for four hours, and, they, and then they came in for supper. And while they were out, on those four hours, they only got to see a small fraction of the plantation. And the plantation owner asked Mr. Wesley, well, Mr. Wesley, what do you think? Wesley replied, I think you're going to have a hard time leaving all of this. <laughs> Will you have a hard time leaving all the things you have when God calls you home to heaven? You know, one of the hard things as, as we age is, and, and sometimes we make several transitions, but we, we lose some rights and privileges and things that we love doing and we can't do them anymore and then all of a sudden we have to move and we may move into um, assisted living or something like that and we get rid of three-fourths of what we move and then sometimes we even end up in a nursing home and everything gets down to one little cubby. And in the process of all of that, that's, that, it's a good reminder for all of us that, you know, possessions, <laughs> they come with us and then they go out. What does your heart belong to? And Jesus says, be careful that your heart doesn't get attached to things and to money and all of that. And then Jesus gives this last thing and he says, treasures in heaven are not like treasures on earth. They don't decay. They can't be stolen. They don't rot or mildew or anything else. And J the Jewish people would have understood treasures in heaven as, as good works and deeds of compassion and mercy. And so Jesus is really saying, you know, remember that whatever you do, what significance will happen as a result of your life from what you did here on earth? Make sure your life isn't all about what you can keep because you're going to lose it all <laughs> the day Jesus calls you home to heaven. And then there's this kind of puzzling passage that Jesus walks into and he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy... Your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Well, that phrase, the eye is the lamp of the body, 
in the context of this whole passage means that your focus is going to be your what you focus on will find its way into your whole life and heart. Whatever I focus on an, on a daily basis is eventually going to get into my heart. <laughs> and if I'm always focusing on something and that becomes a focus of my life, eventually it takes over my heart and it becomes number one. And Jesus said, be careful that whatever it is, be careful that he remains, that God remains that one thing that you focus on all the time. Because it's really easy, especially in our American culture, for other things to replace him. And he says, if you focus on the right things, it will bring light to your life. And if you focus on the wrong things, it will bring darkness to your life. And so Jesus is saying, that he, if we focus on him, he will bring health and wholeness into our life. And if we focus on other things, eventually they will destroy our life. Whatever it might be. And then he closes in verse 24, or at least I'm closing, he goes on. We'll come back to that next week. But Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So he's been asking these questions. Where will you lay up treasure? On earth or in heaven? What will you fix your eyes on? And now, whom will you serve? Now, God has made every single one of us with a spirit that has an emptiness until God fills it. And if we don't fill it with him, we fill it with other stuff. Because it's, it's, it's like a hungry stomach. It's just gnawing at us all the time. It wants to be filled. And so we just cram stuff in there, whether it fits or not, whether it meets the need or not. And Jesus says, you know, if you don't fill your life, if you don't fill that spirit with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to fill it with other things. And sometimes that's ourselves, sometimes that's money, sometimes it's possessions, sometimes it's work, sometimes it's addictions, sometimes it's just fame, sometimes it's just entertainment. Who knows what it is? But all of us have those things that we're, we tend to want to fill our hearts with instead of Christ. And Jesus says, you know, you might be able to work for two employers, have a full-time job and a part-time job, and work for two employers. But if you're a slave, you can only be a slave to one person. <laughs> and he said the heart is designed to really give itself only to one. And so be very careful that when you, you, you have to make this conscious choice I want to give my heart to God, because if you don't make that conscious choice, you will automatically just start filling it with other things, and they will creep in and become that number one slave master of your life. You'll just live your life around getting more and more of that thing. And you won't even realize that God has departed, that he's no longer the one thing in your life. You can love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and still have possessions and money. But you cannot love money and possessions with all your heart and still love God with all your heart. E. Stanley Jones was a great missionary in India uh, many years ago, and he wrote that the people who handle money the best are the people who serve God with that money. And money and possessions becomes an instrument uh, of God's kingdom. There's some final thoughts I just want to share with you uh, in regard to just what the Bible has to say about finances. Finances follow the rule of later and greater. If you handle your finances based on what you want today, and that's your, your primary objective, you will never have much tomorrow. <laughs> you always have to think in terms of finances, in terms of what is best down the road. 
and handle your finances that way. And, and you'll, there's numbers, especially in Proverbs, numbers of verses in the scripture that teach us to handle our finances, to think about down the road. Pay now, play later. Um, finances, secondly, have never from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to Revelation chapter 22, finances have never, ever been fair. It's, they've never been fair in the history of the world. There are governments that will say they will try to make it fair and there's socialism and communism and we'll just spread the pot out and pretty soon everyone is very poor. <laughs> it's never worked in the history of the world except for a few people at the top who get everything. <laughs> and and. So what I'm telling you is that just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're going to be wealthy or poor. <laughs> Finances aren't fair. And there will be people around you that have more than you have. And there will be people around you that have less than you have. And you might be in the middle. You might be at the bottom of the pile. You might be way up there on top. That doesn't really matter. What God is concerned about is not how much you have. But where what you have relates to your heart. And, and, and I've known Christians who didn't hardly have anything. And their hearts weren't right. Because they were so envious and jealous of Christians who had more than they had. <laughs> and I've also known Christians who didn't hardly have anything. Whose hearts were in great shape. Because even while they didn't have much, they loved the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart and they trusted God to provide for their needs from one day to the next. And, and a lot of those people, they didn't know where next day was coming from. And I've known people that were richer than any of us who loved God first and foremost in their life and used their money extremely well. And met all kinds of needs around them. And I've known wealthy people that uh, it was all about them. And God was somewhere down the list. And God was just for show. <laughs> so be careful of thinking that, you know, just because I'm a Christian, I should have this or that or something else. No. Um, find a way to honor and love God with the finances that he has given to you. Thirdly, the more finances we have, oftentimes the less disciplined and balanced we become with it. <laughs> a lot of times when we get a hold of finances, especially if we haven't had them, we tend to start doing things with our finances that we would have never dreamed that we would have done with our finances when we didn't have finances. And then we have to start checking our hearts um, because the Bible actually says more about managing your money than it says about giving your money. <laughs> Remember that everything you and I have belongs to him. And we are to be good stewards of it. Um, and I don't get to choose how I spend my money because it's his money. And so I have to, I have to make sure that God approves of the way my checkbook looks. <laughs> and God approves of the things I spend my resources on and all of that. If you really want to know where somebody's heart is, check out the way they spend their money. And then there's always going to be this tension in our lives, if we're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, this tension between serving stuff and serving God. Till the day you die, there'll be that tension in your life. Don't think that's going to go away. And, and you can't compare yourself to anyone else. I can't look at you and judge you, and you can't look at me and judge me. Every one of us has to have that relationship with God where we can say, God, this resource you put in my hands, how do you want me to handle it? And what do you want me to do with it? And trust him to talk to me and, and 
lead me and that kind of stuff. I have to continually surrender my stuff to God. Otherwise, stuff begins to replace God in my life. And then, lastly, know where your money is going because it's not your money. It's not your possessions. It's God's, and we are just stewards of it. We're going to close this morning by singing Take My Life and Let It Me. Before we do that, I just want to pray with you uh, this morning. Father God, I just thank you for the way that Jesus talks to us. And, and he just talks to us about things that are really real life things in our life. Today, he really talks to us about things that really kind of get under our skin and in our hearts and in the groove and the ruts of our lives. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to order our lives in a way that honors and pleases you. Help us to remember that our days are numbered. And help us to live our lives with all, of, all the things that you give us and all the blessings that you bring our way. Help us, Lord, to use them in a way that pleases you. Help us to give ourselves and to surrender ourselves to you again and again, day after day. In Jesus' name, amen.